Namaste and welcome to Kaivalya Yoga Gurukulam or KYG. Thank you as always for taking time and attending this satsang, thereby giving us all this opportunity to come together in this Akashic space, if you will, to explore higher dimensions of consciousness to this, through the study of this divine chakra that we know as the Sri Chakra, which is a collection of so many, many chakras within it. In today's class, 
we shall cover an important aspect of the Sri Chakra. All of these energies that we are covering in all these classes, they all form part of the Devi Khadgamala Stotram. But we have not come to the chanting and then the procedure and all of that because we still have energies that we need to cover, in other words, to understand. Because when we chant, we should know each name, what it means, where do they fall, which part of the chakra are they, what do they mean to us in our own consciousness. And therefore, we come to the next group of energies, if you will. And these energies are found in the 8th Avarna or the 8th gate. So we are taking one step back now. The ninth Avarna was the Bindu. We saw that in the last class. And that is beyond all comprehensions, all worship and everything. There, there is none, none of us exist there. So we come back to the triangle here, the innermost sanctum sanctorum. And there we find that there is a divine opportunity to explore the most highest principle through a collection of energies, all of them eventually grouped into these three that we studied in the 8th Avarna, the Maha Kameshwari, Maha Vajreshwari and Maha Bhagamalini. So let us explore this. We'll get an, a deeper understanding of this. Now, before we go there, in the Devi Khadgamala Stotra or, or the chant, if you will, where we begin chanting, there is a procedure. And right in the very beginning, we mention these particular energies. So, though the Sri Chakra stands, starts from the outermost chakra, can, can we have the slides, please? Though we start the procedure from the outermost chakra that you see faded in the background, and we go in chakra by chakra or avarna by avarna or gate by gate, however we want to call this. But right in the very beginning, we touch upon this triangle, the eighth avarna, and then start from outside. It's a very unique practice, a very unique thing. One has to understand this. That is why rituals have significance when you do it. You have to relate to it and connect to it intellectually, emotionally and eventually you will connect to it through experience. So right in the very beginning and you will learn it once we, we come across that. Right in the very beginning we are invoking 16 energies and those 16 energies we focus on the 8th chakra, the 8th avarna and then we go back to the outermost avarna and start from there and come in. That is very fascinating. So these deities are known as Nitya Devis. Nitya Devis. Nitya means constant. Nitya means eternal. Nitya means always. So they are always present. They are constant and they are eternally present. There is no beginning and ending to these 16 energies. Before we mention these 16 energies, some of you who know this already will know what these 16 energies are, but understand why we, from the very beginning, after the very first few mantras, we directly go invoke these 16 energies and then start the whole journey into the chakra and again come to these, the triangle there. It's a unique way of approach because logically it would make sense start from outside and go in as we studied the Sri Chakra. But when you come, when it comes down to practice, when it comes down to a ritualistic practice, meditative practice, a contemplative practice, the, the, it slightly varies, the, 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 the structure of this varies. What are these 16 deities or energies or devis? And they are all Devis, right? We, we see them all as female energies because they are all part of this creation. The entire creation is feminine. And the masculine energy, Shiva, is just lost in, in his own self. That is in the Bindu. 
So from that Bindu has emerged all of this and all of this will eventually go back into the Bindu. As a personal experience, as a cosmic experience, at that point it really doesn't matter. You are the cosmos. Without you, the universe doesn't exist. Like in deep sleep, when you are fast asleep, what happens? The universe doesn't exist there right? because you don't exist. In, in a manner of speaking. So we need some experience we can relate to, right? So I'm using deep sleep as an experience. So when we are fast asleep, we don't, ex we don't exist. And therefore the universe around us doesn't exist. That the, 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 the poorest man on this street is as fast asleep, even though it may be for a few minutes, as much as the richest man in the world is also fast asleep. And in that state of being fast asleep, both don't exist. It doesn't matter whether one is rich or poor. It really doesn't matter because they themselves don't exist. Right? So that is the Bindu. From the Bindu comes all of this and therefore all of this is Shakti and creation. Now, in order to understand this, these female energies, one has to understand the nature of the mind. In the ritualistic practice in the practice of tantra tantra means rituals okay let that that word has got a bad reputation unfortunately tantra it somehow um, seems to be more associated with some sexual practices that that's bizarre uh, the 99 percent of the tantric practices are simply rituals like lighting a candle or lighting incense sticks they're all part of tantra anyway um we are not talking of that one or two percent uh, of that kind of practice at all because I don't have an experience in that, so I won't talk about that. But but when we approach Tantra, the Tantric point of view, all of this Yantra, this drawing, rituals, meditations, rich and contemplations on visualizations, forms, symbols, all are part of Tantra. Nothing is outside Tantra. Tantra, Mantra and Yantra, that's all the practice is. All right, so in that, the mind is understood in a unique manner. In yoga, we understand as the six chakras and so on. In Vedanta, we understand it as a pr principally, I'm saying, all of these really are not watertight compartments or subjects. They all borrow ideas from each other. They all blend into each other. But just for our understanding here, yoga looks at the mind existing in the six chakras. So as the chakras open, different aspects of the mind open leading to the spiritual experiences and so on. That is the yoga part. The Vedanta part talks about the panchakoshas, the five sheets, annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, the body sheet, the breath sheet. Within the breath, there is the mind. Within the mind, there is intuitive intellect. And within that, there is the bliss sheet and so on they go. That's an intellectual, perhaps intuitive uh, manner of understanding this aspect of the mind and the potential of the mind. In Tantra Vidya, Tantra Vidya, Vidya means knowledge. Tantra means this practice of rituals. We need symbols to understand. And therefore the moon is symbolic of the mind. The sun in Tantra Shastra, the sun is the, sim is the symbol of what? If moon is the symbol of the mind, the sun is the symbol of the Atma. That Bindu, the energy there. The Shivalinga, Shiva, if you will, the primordial being, if you will, Purusha, Sun. Because the moon is a reflection of the sun, it comes from the sun and she brings in the beauty at night. She becomes that creative energy and therefore she is connected to the mind. In fact, there is, there is an esoteric version of understanding Ramayana as the nature of understanding the sun energy within us. And the whole of Krishna's story, the Mahabharata, the Krishna story is understanding the moon nature. Because Krishna is moon energy. Right from his nakshatra, Rohini nakshatra, and the, where the moon is in its brightest and the most powerful. All of that are indications of Krishna being the... And these are avatara stories I'm talking about. So avatars and the study of that is the moon energy, Krishna. And Rama is the solar dynasty and so on and so he is from the sun so sun and moon represent the energy principles in us and we have talked about it in other classes in kaivalya marga and so on and we'll perhaps come across this because that's part of yoga where the right side of the body is the sun the left side is the moon 
Ida and Pingala and we are all the time, the beauty of life is to keep them in harmony. Right? So that from that Purusha Prakriti, Purusha and Prakriti, Sun and the Moon, comes the three Gunas, the Ahankara, the Eye and then the five elements, the entire creation. That's why I said we can draw all of this into us, the whole of creation into me. Because I, the sun in me is that ultimate Purusha. So, when I say sun in me, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, um, a, a, I don't know the figure of speech for that, but it, it's a self-defeating <laughs> proposition because the sun is not in me as in Sundar. The sun is in itself. The eye is in the eye. Everything is Purnamada, Purnamidam, that level we are talking about. Anyway. So now coming to the mind and therefore Tantra regards moon as the mind. So understanding the moon gives us a glimpse into understanding the divine potential that exists in our mind. And in these, these the, the phases of the moon, the 15 phases of the moon are the 15 different energies that reside in our mind. This is the basis of Tantra and basically uh, that's why I said these are not watertight compartments. This kind of this kind of knowledge goes into astrology and therefore the phases of the moon, the timing of the moon, the moon and its combination with the star constellations or nakshatras, all of that play an important role in Vedic astrology, Hindu astrology, they pay attention to the time where the moon was at the time of your birth. They call it Rashi. For most of you from India would know this. They call it the Rashi. Now, I'm not talking about the interpretations and the commercializations of all of that because that's, that's kind of ruined the science for us or the study of that sacred science. But there is the, the basis of that sacred science is never tarnished. Just like science itself cannot be tarnished because atom bomb is used for unproductive or harmful purposes. We can't blame science for that. It, that's a different ener uh, whole energy. So don't un misunderstand and these are not blind beliefs. I'm trying to link and give you an idea as to how deep this study goes. Forms an important part of Vedanta. Forms an important part of Yoga. Forms an important part of Tantra Vidya. Forms an important part of our own spiritual progress. Right now you and I are able to comprehend a little bit of what is going on in the Sri Chakra because of mind. So, so a lot of emphasis was paid to, a lot of attention was paid to the different phases of the moon. So there are spiritual practices linked to the phases of the moon. Unfortunately, it got dogmatic, it became religious and got boxed into right and wrong and so on and so forth. But if you get out of that box, understand the basic principle, you will begin to appreciate that the moon and the mind have always been understood as being interconnected in a sense that we can relate to. And therefore, in understanding the phases of the moon, right from being the new moon to the full moon and, and vice versa, from and, and the journey of the moon from the full moon back to the new moon, Right? From being nothing, it becomes full. And then from being full, it goes back to nothing. And that cycle goes on. Cycle goes on. So the nature of our mind is also similar, right? Our minds are never steady and still. It would become boring. So there are phases. Are they linked? And if so, how they are linked? That's a fascinating thing. It, it, it can never be a one objective way of looking at it. Because each one of us are very unique in, in the cosmic scheme of things. If, if you're missing in this, in, in this, at this moment, if you're missing, then mind you, there is a vacancy in creation. You are that important. And therefore, we all have a role, a very unique role. And therefore, in that uniqueness lies energy and power. So, I cannot say this is the way you can understand and link moon to your creator, the fifth night of the moon or the sixth day of the moon can be do, can we do, we can do this, we can do that. However, we can get an idea of, of understanding this link. And then that search and study goes on and on and on. The more we study the cosmos, 
the more we understand ourselves the more we understand ourselves the more we begin to appreciate and accept the cosmos so i i think i've laid the basis now this becomes the basis of these nitya devis there are 16 nitya devis we will study the 15 connected to the 15 phases of the moon and then we'll come to the 16th one and all of that is in the innermost triangle the last triangle before the bindu that is very fascinating that means that even though we think of the sri chakra and in the course of the last 50 odd classes we would have perhaps got this idea that oh my god this is so complicated how am i ever going to progress from one avarna to the other and so on and so forth yes the journey is not easy but where are we going is it to a foreign land we are actually going into our own mind and therefore right in the very beginning you go to the innermost triangle and invoke the deities of the mind and they are going to guide us through this journey so where does the guidance come from guidance is coming from our own mind not from some beings out there who needs to be pleased and so on and so forth so the more we are clear about this thinking the more we are um mindful about these chants the more we are focused and understanding is becomes clearer the, the the whole practice becomes more effective otherwise it is what is that it is what is we see now what do we see now generally speaking and i know there are great exceptions but i'm saying generally what is it that we observe we observe all of this is become a ritual I don't have time. Can I do this in ten minutes? Will Devi be happy if I do it in fifteen minutes? Can I do something fast, and so on and so forth? Those are rituals. They yield. It's my experience. So I'm just sharing my experience and my view and my belief that they don't yield anything other than making you feel good that you're doing something pleasing somebody out there. There is no true spiritual growth awareness and that sense of freedom and abundance that comes from within. the experience of higher dimensions of consciousness the opening of the chakras the the enabling of that mind to truly go into this innermost triangle remains a matter of belief it rarely becomes a matter of experience so in this class in the next class perhaps we have to focus on these 16 devis because they become they come right in the very beginning of katgamala stotra and when i'm when i chant this stotra i'm going to meditate on the sri chakra in the practice that we'll come to but where do i focus now when i chant these names i focus on the innermost triangle this triangle that i have brought it out for you is from the innermost triangle that we just recently covered okay and the eighth avarna right the innermost triangle the innermost is the bindu that's not a triangle so the innermost triangle is the eighth avarna or the eighth gate the innermost is one dot that is not a triangle not even a circle that is just a dot there's no other way to explain a bindu right it is pure existence that's all all right so what are these nitya devis the first one is at the base of the triangle so we have covered this in the eighth avarna don't get confused that is the those are the mother of all the three gunas these are the 15 which is part of those three gunas okay so don't get confused with the placement though they may appear same so the first one is at the base of the triangle now before we go there there is one more point i want to cover the way we are going to study is is from the new moon the moon begins to grow into the full moon and then from the full moon it reverses back its journey back to the new moon from nothingness comes everything from everything we go back to nothing right from the shiva consciousness everything emerges and then he dissolves everything into his consciousness that's that's the idea of this this the, the understanding of the moon from the new moon 
That's why we call it new. It's a birth. No moon or new moon. So from that, a moon is born. It grows to its fullest dimension. And then gently it reverses back, back to the source. Okay? That is the understanding. So the 15, the way we are going through this is going to be from new moon to the full moon. And then of course there is a reverse version of that. So the, that is called the Shukla Paksha for those of you know in Sanskrit. It's not really un, require, required at this point. It's just a term that we need to know. It's, it's a bright half. The bright fortnight or the waxing phase of the moon is what we are going to study as the 15 nights of the moon. Days and nights. Okay. Because see the way they understand is the moon draws energy in the night from the sun. And then in the daytime with the sun, it shares that energy, distributes that energy. We don't see that. But the moon is very much there. We, we don't see doesn't mean the moon doesn't exist. The moon is very much there. Correct? And so day and night, the phases of the moon play, play an important role in Indian Vedic astrology, in the way they approach things and so on and so forth. A lot of misunderstanding has happened. I might cover one or two as we go along. But nevertheless, let's see. The first one the name of that energy of the first night after the new moon. New moon is over. Then the first, the first um, phase, let's call it phase because night and day might confuse you. Let's call it phase. The first phase. And if I say night by chance, remember I'm talking 15 phases. So the first phase. The first phase is also Kameshwari. This Kameshwari is different from Maha Kameshwari. So it is like New York City and New York State. I always draw that example. So let's not confuse. All of these are small sample uh, uh, sample energies, if you will, because our mind can relate to this. The Mahakameshwari is there. The one that energizes all of this. The Mahavajreshwari is there. The Mahabhagamalini is there. They energize all of this because they are the three qualities, essential qualities of creation itself. So don't get confused between Kameshwari and Maha Kameshwari. That's why the names were Maha Kameshwari, Maha Vajreshwari, Maha Bhagamalini. We might come across those energies here as Kameshwari, Vajreshwari, Bhagamalini. They are a minuscule idea that conveys that three gunas. So Kameshwari here is desire. So I'll try and lead you um, in, 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 in order to understand this, we'll try and, and see how does this work? How does this mind, how there is a chance for the mind to evolve? So we, we have uh, thousands of thoughts every day and thousands of desires, if you will. So I'm going to take just one a snapshot of one and see how this could be understood to understand the energies. That's all. It's a purely an academic exercise. It has no relevance in reality because there are so many other complications that come. Okay, so let us say a desire happens as a beginning on the first night after the new moon. Now, this is all related to what we do as traditional practices with when there was a lifestyle that was based on the moon, cycles of the moon, a whole lifestyle was based. Today, parts of it are based and it's, there's a lot more confusion. But nevertheless, when that lifestyle was based, they would say always start something new on the first night or the first uh, phase after the new moon. Because that is where Kameshwari, she gives birth to that desire. She will, she will protect that desire that comes in your mind. She will give that protection because she is there. That energy of the moon is ideal for us to plant a seed. Oh, I need to do a painting. Oh, I need to do something. I need to study this. All right. Start on the first phase after the new moon. It's a good chance that you might succeed. Of course, there is a lot of determination. Everything is required. But all of that will help as you understand these different energies. So I'm going to use that as an example. So think of <coughs> any desire. And then comes the second phase. So that is Kameshwari. Kama means desire. Kameshwari, she is a, she's a queen of all desires. And so she helps you channel that desire. Then comes the second phase. Look at how we are traveling across that triangle. We are going to fill that triangle 
with all these 15 faces. That is how powerful the triangle is, the innermost triangle. So don't don't blame your mind because your mind, whichever energy it is, it is pr producing at that point. They're all Devi's talking to you, conveying to you something. Listen, okay. Then comes the second one, Kameshwari. Now here comes Bhagamalini. Now you might say, oh wait a minute, Mahabhagamalini was up there in that corner, or maybe in the other corner. I'm, you know, I know my fingers and the way you look at it will might different. But when we studied the eighth Tavarna, there was Maha Kameshwari was right at, at the right spot, so she matched with Kameshwari. But Maha Bhagamalini was somewhere else, and this is Bhagamalini coming second right here. That's why I said they are separate energies. They could happen that they can be together or nearby, or they could be separate. So don't confuse these energies. Bhagamalini, like we understood in the previous one, Bhagamalini is is a series of lights she keeps she keeps giving because she's a Saraswati energy, right? So when a desire comes, she can put it off if she needs to. But if there is strength in that desire, if there is a, a good desire, then she will promote it as well. So it's it's like we can use that. So the second stage, what happens is she provides continuity because she's constantly empowering that desire. That is why if you start a practice in our ancient traditions, they, they would say Dvitiya Vignam, don't stop on the second day. Don't stop on the second day because second day is where the Saraswati energy is actually, Bhagamalini is giving you that. She is feeding light and wisdom into that. Continuity, she is helping you with continuity. Like when we do a workout, one day we are all excited, we all get together and go for a long, long run or a long walk or a long hike or a, or we jog or do some exercise and then the next day our body aches and we're like oh gosh what did we do right and on that first day we had made up our mind we're going to do this every day it is so enjoyable walking in the sun walking out for half an hour whatever it is second day you're like oh gosh i can't even move my limbs i'm not going to do anymore i can't do now i'll do it after a few days if we had started this rightly on the first phase of the moon after the new moon then the second one is actually helping you to continue if it is an exercise it's possible that your body may not be as sore or you might develop that will to continue but we have to develop that and therefore she is there bhagamalini i may not be very good in explaining this but i'm sure i'm giving you an idea because these are to to, the, the reason why I'm, I'm suggesting these anecdotes, examples are to give you and us an idea of how deep they went into naming each of the phases of the moon and how they connected that to their own mind, the sages, the yogis. And so we have to take that as a basis to start our own journey, to understand our own mind in its entirety. All right. Then comes the third phase. What is the third phase? The third phase is Nitya Kline. All of them are Nitya. So Nitya Kameshwari, Nitya Bhagamalini, Nitya Kline. So for poetic reasons, for pronunciation and for the meter purposes, instead of simply saying Kline, they said Nitya Kline. Nitya means every day, constant, always. So the moon is always there, correct? And thus all of these energies will always be there. So Nitya Nitya comes. It's, it's understood for the other mantras. Here, Kline is a very short name. And therefore, they use Nitya Kline. Nitya Kline means soaked, wet, drenched. So, here, now that idea that was given energy is now getting soaked. You're, you're getting soaked. It's, you're allowing it to come into your system. You're constantly thinking about it now. right? It is becoming a part of you. Nitya Kline. Soaked. The mind is now soaked with that idea. Then comes the fourth phase. The fourth phase is Bherunde. Bherunda or Bherunde. Bherunde, I'm saying day day because that's how the mantras will come when we chant the Khadgamala. Bherunde is, is like a Shiva energy actually. So Bherunde is um, a, a fierce bird of prey 
It is an energy that has the power to remove poisons. What poison are we talking about? Obstacles. Obstacles are poison. Right? All kinds of obstacles. Physical obstacles in the form of illnesses is a poison. Uh, physical op uh, mental obstacles are poisons. Poisons means things which um, delude us, which uh, rob us of our divinity. So this poison, this Bhairunde Shakti has that that energy to remove that poison, like the bird of prey, like Garuda and eagles and all of them. They can eat a poisonous serpent and the poison won't affect them because the acidity is, is, is so high, correct? And so Bhairunde energy they talked about in the fourth phase of the moon that we know as Chaturthi. Chaturthi is a Sanskrit word, right? Pratama, Dvitiya, Tritiya. Chaturthi. Chaturthi is fourth. And therefore in Chaturthi what we do as a religious practice, it was a spiritual practice but it's become religious, it doesn't matter. But rightly so, we worship Ganesha because Ganesha is the energy of the Devi who will help you bring out this, this poison, uh, this, this bird of prey that can remove all your obstacles. So Ganesha is linked. That's why Ganesha, um, Kartikeya, Parvati, Shiva, we have to understand that family and Shaivism from all of that point of view. So Shakti worship is not devoid of Ganapatyas or Ganapatyas or people who worship Ganesha. It's all connected, right? So nevertheless, this is why Chaturthi becomes an important phase in all our spiritual practices. We start on the first day. On the fourth day, we pray, please remove all the obstacles. And we get that energy to remove whatever obstacles we might be facing for that desire that was planted or the practice that was begun on the very first day. Bhairunde. And then comes Vakni Vasini. The fifth one, Vakni. Vakni is Agni. Agni means fire. I've put these words in English in, in, in parenthesis just for, to give you an idea of what that word is, to, to relate to that energy. They're not exactly the same grammatically correct meaning. They're not incorrect, but don't confine the energy to that one word. That one word is just a window that opens your mind to understanding that energy. Vakni Vasini, the one who resides in the fire. So now the obstacles are cleared, what happens for that practice? It's gaining momentum. There is a chance for us to gain momentum on the fifth phase, during the fifth phase of the moon. Think of any new habit you want to start or any new practice you want to start, any new habit you want to break. On the fifth day, we get that energy, Vakni. She resides in the fire. That fifth day is Panchami. It's, it's, it's related to the energy of Shiva because Shiva has a third eye. The third eye is fire and in that there is Shakti energy and therefore there is Naga Panchami and all of these um, festivals that are linked to all of these festivals are linked to lunar cycles, correct? So Chaturthi, then Panchami, the fifth night is Vakni Vasini, the one who resides in the fire. That means the, the momentum is caught on. Okay, let's go to the next five. Then comes next five, in other words, the sixth, Shashti. That is Vajreshwari. Now she coincides with Mahavajreshwari in that placement of that Bindu. She coincides, but nevertheless, just like we understood Kameshwari and Mahakameshwari, don't get confused. Vajreshwari is Vajra, Vajra Sankalpa, we say, the will, the resolute will. So here, that, that practice has a chance to become firmly established in your consciousness, in your everyday activity, whatever that is, correct? Now you have a chance on the sixth night or the sixth phase, sixth day, Vajreshwari's energy is there. So now establish it properly in your consciousness. Don't try to do that on the very second day and get, get discouraged. Second day, just continue, just continue. Come to the yoga mat and just drag yourself to the yoga mat. Stretch something or do something just for the sake of doing what you did yesterday because that is continuity. Then she says, okay, good. The mind understands that, grabs it and that energy of continuity comes. So from there it goes on, right? Bhagamalini, Nityaklini and all of that. 
So, Berunde Bhakni Vasini, and now comes this Vajreshwari. Now there is a chance to place a resolute will. Then we come to the next one, the seventh Saptami. Saptami is Shivaduti. When the will becomes resolute, when the practice has a sense of settling down in our consciousness. Now this is all assuming that we live a lifestyle in tune with the cosmos. Okay, We have come far away from that. But let us open the doors to understanding at least and eventually it will all follow. So Shivaduti, Shivaduti is messenger of Shiva. She, I'm sorry, she made Shiva as the messenger. Shiva is the messenger of the Shakti. What does it mean? Then that door of knowledge of that particular practice begins to open and the divinity begins. Divinity is there everywhere, right? Divinity of that practice, whatever that practice is, and especially so if it's a spiritual practice, divinity begins to convey to you. Knowledge and wisdom begins to come to you. On Saptami. That's why Saptami is Ratha Saptami. We say the sun is at his mightiest energy there and so on. Because the divine messenger, how come Shiva, Shiva is a messenger means what? Of course, in a, in a superficial way, we'll say, Oh, Devi is so powerful, she even makes Shiva his messen her messenger and even he's subservient and all of that. That is at a very simple level. But divinity becoming a messenger, he is conveying his message to you. That means you are, he is directly coming to you as a messenger. Imagine Shiva coming to your home as a postman or Sai ringing the bell and giving you. If that divine energy is coming to you, to you that is Saptami, that is that energy. But remember what is fall before that. It is Vajreshwari. Vajreshwari and then Shivaduti. Then comes the eighth phase. The eighth phase is Tvarite. Tvarita, Tvarite. Tvarite means fast, swift, swiftness. Once the divine messenger has given you that intuitive awareness, then guess what is going to happen? It has to become swift. The journey into that achievement of that desire. And I told you right in the beginning, there are thousands of such desires. But I'm just taking one snapshot of one single thing. There is all of this happening. So on the seventh, I'm sorry, on the eighth night or the eighth phase of the moon, it gathers momentum. It gathers speed, swiftness towards accomplishment. Eighth night is halfway between the new moon and the full moon. It is, it is a turning point. On the eighth phase of the moon, the look, when you look at the moon, it look exactly the same, whether it is in waxing phase or in the waning phase. Waxing or waning, the eighth looks the same. And therefore, Ashtami, this particular phase is considered as the crown jewel. This energy, she resides in the crown of the Devi. Again, symbolically for us to understand that this is a very powerful energy that, that the cosmic creative energy, Shakti, places right on top of her head on a crown. What will you display the most, the most, your favorite jewel? And she places it on her crown. What, what phase of the moon? The eighth phase of the moon. This is one of the most misunderstood phases of the moon. Unfortunately, thanks to a complete misunderstanding of what is Ashtami, Ashtami is a Sanskrit word for the eighth phase of the moon. Even in history, the divine energy of Krishna took birth on Ashtami. 
So the great authors have told us how powerful this phase is, how deeply spiritually energetic is this phase. But unfortunately today, and I need to share this because at this point we got to relate to what is going on now. Otherwise we'll have questions. You're saying Ashtami is the crown jewel, but everybody says Ashtami is a bad night or a bad day. Let me come to that point. Why there was that logic and why that logic has been completely lopsided and misunderstood. So because Ashtami is such a powerful spiritual phase of the moon, why is it powerful again? It is simply in the middle. What is so powerful in being in the middle? The whole idea of spirituality is samatvam, equanimity, balance, stillness. Stillness doesn't come when you are completely leaning on one side. That is one end of the spectrum. Or the other side, stillness is when you are neither here nor there. And that comes from balance. And therefore balance is, in, in yoga practice, as one of the corner, cornerstones of yoga practices. It helps focus the mind, steady. So steadiness, balance, all of that is Tvarita. Tvarite is that energy right in the middle of her journey. And Devi picks that energy and places it on her crown for our symbolic understanding, if you want to connect to it in a poetic, emotional, uh, artistic manner. So how did it, how did we end up or how did this, this phase end up getting such a bad reputation? Why are people afraid of Ashtami? Oh, don't do anything on Ashtami. Don't do anything on Ashtami. This is it. Because it is so spiritual in nature, it was understood as on this phase, during this phase of the moon, during this night of the moon or the day of the moon, whenever that phase is in, in whichever part of the world you are in at that point. Because some, sometimes Ashtami or this eighth phase can start at morning six o'clock and end by night uh, the next morning three o'clock or four o'clock. So the whole day is pretty much Ashtami. Correct? So because of the spiritual nature and the power of this day, they said, and what was taught to us was, don't do anything materialistic. Don't do anything that will tilt the balance of your emotions and your mind to extremes. Just stay put in balance, in equanimity, in meditation, in contemplation. Because we said, don't do anything, and because in the last 100 years, if you will, 150 years, if you will, all our actions are only materialistic. Well, I wouldn't say all, but at least uh, most. We want to get something, go somewhere, something, something or the other, and we're constantly chasing. It makes sense not to do any of those on Ashtami, but on Ashtami day, just simply meditate if you can. Otherwise, just carry on whatever you're doing. It just it, It's not going to harm you. We all have to travel sometimes. We have to do things. It just go. It, there'll be no effectiveness or it, there's, there's no energy there for whatever you want to do. It's, it's a waste of spiritual energy there. The time I could have used for meditation, the time I could have used on contemplating on these energies, especially the Mahadevi energy within me, the Atmic principle, because at this this night is perfect for that, because Krishna was born. Krishna was the energy of the mind, was born. If somebody was sitting and writing stories, they could have said Rama was also born that night. No, Krishna. That is the beauty there. So Krishna being born on Ashtami, means that Krishna can be born in you. In other words, your divine nature can be revealed to you on Ashtami. There is a chance for that door to open. So it's right there on the crown of Devi's head. Ashtami is a very spiritual phase. When I used to do my Kadgamala practice, now with the last three years it's different. It will only be on Ashtami that I would take time to read and contemplate on these mantras 
and contemplate on the whole Sri Chakra. It is only on Ashtami. Because that is the perfect time to go into Sri Chakra worship, meditation on Devi and so on. Try it. There is no right and wrong. Just try it. There is so much beauty in the Ashtami phase, spiritually speaking. Because all spiritual practices aim towards balancing its samatvam, equanimity. That's where we are going to. We never seek any extremities in spiritual progress. If so, then that's not a spiritual practice. And therefore, Tvarite or Tvarita is a divine energy that will bless you. And once you get that, you are swiftly going towards the goal of whatever it is you are seeking. So, if I started a practice on yoga, whatever it is, uh, exercises, on the eighth day, I'll just crystallize where I am, not seek, oh, I need to go here, I need to go there. No, just say. And in that acceptance, in that contentment, in that being in that practice, being content in that practice, swiftness is given to you. Success, the, 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 the doors of success open to you for that particular practice. Contentment, balance, equanimity, meditation, contemplation. These are the practices on the eighth phase of the moon. No matter what your undertaking is. So, this is how we related to the, the phases of the moon. We are running out of time. So, I don't want to go through the next seven in this class and try to rush it and finish it and nor do I want to um, cut it because there are a couple of other beautiful energy is there and nights or phases of the moon that we need to focus and understand. But let's take a, a, a couple of moments here just to grasp the enormity of understanding that the ancient seers, the yogis and the sages had when they undertook and this this not only just the study but they undertook this this uh, we don't know who has done this but this the gigantic effort to present it so that you and I can understand. This was a closely guarded secret for centuries. Because once taught properly, once understood properly, this opens the universe with all its abundance to you and to me and to everyone. There is nothing to stop us from experiencing the highest once we understand the principles behind the Sri Chakra. And therefore it was closely guarded, taught very mindfully. Unlike what you find today in a weekend course or a couple of weeks course and it just goes off. You might get something, but it, 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 it's, it's, it's a far cry out there from what you can actually achieve if you take your own time to study. That's why in the beginning also I said, take one Devata, one energy for a whole day. There are 182 such energies. Take 182 days, that's like about six months. And then come backwards from there, all the way back to number one, the next six months. That is why they came up with 182, to signify six months and six months take a whole year to understand the Sri Chakra. Go into the Sri Chakra and come back out from the Sri Chakra and then go in again, come out. What happens is our consciousness begins to tune in to the rhythms of the universe. We begin to understand, appreciate, a deeper part of us begins to open. So, I hope you found this useful and we'll continue this, um, these, the remaining divine energies of our own mind. Remember, these are energies in our mind. We invoke them first, even before we enter the outermost periphery of the Sri Chakra. Something to think about. Let us end as, as always with just a few rounds of the Ayn Klim Sauhu. Sauhu Klim Ayn. Ayn Klim Sauhu so who claim I'm? I'm claim so. 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 So who
May all the beings in all the worlds be happy. Jai Bolo Pavan Sut Hanuman Ki Jai Siyavar Ram Chandra Ki Jai Sat Guru Sai Nath Maharaj Ki Jai Nama Parvati Pataye Har Har Mahadev Om Shanti 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 